Setting up OAuth 2 is not quite as easy as setting up token authentication, uh, and it's a much more complicated topic. But as we'll see, with a little bit of help from the Django ecosystem, setting it up is a lot less painful than it could be. Let's jump straight into it. The first thing I'm going to do in this sublesson is to install the Django OAuth toolkit. It does exactly what you think it might, uh, and I've linked in this commit to the first tutorial that allows you to get started. Now, the uh, OAuth tool toolkit also recommends that you install the Cores middleware tool. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cores, I would recommend reading about it on the Mozilla Developer Network. Uh, it's cross-origin resource sharing and is effectively a means of, of protecting uh, API access. So with these two installed, you, you notice that I've gone ahead and saved all of the other various tools that come with it to make sure that we are upgrading all of those tools as necessary. And I then add in the OAuth2 provider and the course headers into installed app. Uh, the course headers also expects that it's going to be within uh, middleware, and you have the ability to limit uh, who has access to your API by using cores. And, but I instead have said, no, 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 I want to ensure that any browser and any website uh, has, you know, permits their API to access our site. So I say, yes, you know, allow all, please do it. Now, I've also gone ahead and in our REST framework default authentication classes have added in our OAuth2 authentication so that we have the ability to use OAuth2 authentication on our API. Now, I've also gone ahead and added a whole host of paths. And this is according to the uh, tutorial, which again, I've sort of linked up here. I've also, um, on a side note, part of the reason we're using the, the Django OAuth toolkit uh, is because it is the officially recommended OAuth tool uh, at the moment on the Django REST framework website. Anyhow, if you go and take a look at this, you'll notice that in this tutorial part one, they recommend that you simply add in a host of URLs for OAuth2 in this fashion. You'll notice it's namespaced, and I'm using a string rather than the tuple that we previously used, you know, as a means of demonstrating the other way to include URLs. Now, this is not necessarily what you are going to want for production. Uh, in particular, if I come over here and I come to this tab, you can see that I'm in part two of protect your APIs on the Django OAuth Toolkit site. And if I slide down just a little bit, you can see that instead of loading in all of the endpoints indiscriminately as we are currently doing, they limit the various views based on whether you are running in debug or not. So uh, this is simply to follow the tutorial. It is not what you want to be doing in production. I would urge you to take a look at the rest of the tutorial. However, uh, for the moment, this is good enough. And this actually allows you to get started. Uh, if, if we wanted to sort of follow through on this front and use uh, OAuth2 via an API with just that, this actually allows us to. However, this affects the browsable API, and it doesn't allow the full customization uh, that uh, OAuth2 does. So OAuth works on this idea of scope, uh, the idea that you have authorization uh, on specific things. It's a lot like permissions. So permissions, generally you say, you know, I, I would like to have permission to do this specific um, action, uh, in Django in particular, uh, whereas uh, scopes can be uh, whatever you want them to be. Uh, a scope can be treated as I have scope to access an entire object, or maybe I simply have a read permission for a specific object. And how you go about setting up those scopes is entirely up to you. Now, what I've done is instead of just having the, read, the default read-write scope provided by the Django OAuth, OAuth toolkit, in the next commit, I've gone and customized the OAuth scope types. And you can see that in config, I've gone ahead and said uh, that these are the various scopes I would like for the website. And you can see I have Newslink and Post and Startup and Tag. Now I could go ahead and, and get more granular and have you know Newslink colon read and Newslink colon write, or or maybe you know Newslink colon add or Newslink colon change, Newslink colon delete. You know the, there is no limit here, but I have not. I've just limited to that. Now. You'll note I've also changed the default permission classes, uh, and this is specifically so that we have the ability to continue to access 
the browsable API. And I've gone ahead and used the Django model permission system from REST framework so that in the event that there are specific permissions that have been applied on a user, uh, that the API takes those into account on the browsable API, right? So this is this is sort of an interesting place that we've gotten to, where uh, for for actually interacting with the API outside of the browsable API, we're going to be using OAuth two scopes. But if we're in the browsable API, we're using Django model permissions. So there is a little bit of a you, you need to try and integrate those uh, from uh, a an operations standpoint, um, but it is a uh, you are, in fact, using two different um, permission systems that are uh, loosely coupled So, uh, for you to be aware of. But this puts us back in a position where the browsable API works rather than being entirely locked out by the OAuth system. You can see that I have also gone ahead and had to add is authenticated or token scope to a permission class for our root API uh, because the uh, various permission systems above anticipate that um, if you are going to be applying the Django model permissions, it is only on views or view sets that have a query set attribute. And uh, as this is, in fact, a uh, static API view, uh, we did not have that. So we want to limit the permission classes there to only rely on is authenticated or token scope rather than the, rather than the Django model permission. So on the rest of the view sets, I've simply said that the actual scope that is required to view the API or to change it or affect it uh, is tag. Now, if we wanted to actually have something along the lines of uh, tag colon add, tag colon uh, change, delete, what have you, uh, we would not be able to, to simply require the scope here because we are using view sets, and we would have to program our own custom uh, REST API permission, and totally outside the scope of what we're trying to do. But just so you know, you can program your own permissions. Uh, they are you know, Python classes that you then attach in, uh, in this way to view sets, and you can get uh, very granular. You, there's a lot of control that you can exert there. But with that done, this is uh, everything that we need to do to be in a position where uh, we are using OAuth 2 with our own custom scopes while still being in a position, again, where we say, yeah, if, if you're authenticated via session, the browsable API still works, or you, know, you, you have a token scope, uh, and while still using Django model permissions, which we hadn't been doing previously. So you can see this is very powerful. It takes a, a little bit of configuration, which sometimes can be difficult because uh, it looks a little bit like magic. But that's all we had to do to uh, get Django to follow the rules that we saw in, in sub-lesson one when we were using Postman. So from here, you could um, absolutely run this. Now, now that we have this configured, however, uh, we still need to go ahead and actually create the OAuth applications. If you follow the tutorial, uh, the, the toolkit will show you which views to go to and how to click through and use the interface to create those. Now, given that they have a tutorial for that, I'm, I'm going to leave that off on the side. What I'm going to instead show you is that I have created a uh, Jupyter Notebook for you where we go ahead and we do this programmatically because uh, I find that it's uh, you know, a more repeatable process and, and easier to go through and means that if you understand the programmable uh, way of doing this, it also allows you to write tests for this. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, so here we go. We create a new user. We then look at the different uh, OAuth app grant types. You can see that there is a password and a grant authorization type. And we're going to create two OAuth apps. right? So the, the concept of an OAuth app is that there's going to be some third-party application, whether it's a mobile app, whether it's your own front end, uh, that is going to interact with this authorization server so that this authorization server says, oh, yes, you have the ability to access whatever resources you third-party client. Now, you'll see that I'm here creating the password app. And right here, I'm creating the code app. Uh, as we saw when we were going through sublesson one, the password app is a much simpler flow, but because it involves actually handing off the, the user's email and password, it is not as safe as the code app, right? This is the password grant is really for front ends that you're in control of, right? It, it enables you to have a 
the extra layer of granularity that OAuth uh, provides for your authorization uh, without having to do the extra hoops that you might have to, to jump through if you were not already in possession of that data. So the password grant is very much for applications, uh, third-party apps nonetheless, but applications that you control and trust. Whereas the authorization code grant is very much for third parties whom you have no control over, you may not be sure of, right? This is very much the relationship that we saw in the example where we talked about Twitter and a tweet scheduler. The tweet scheduler is, is a completely different organization and Twitter doesn't want them to have your username and password. You don't want to give your username and password for Twitter to these, these other folks. You don't necessarily know that you trust them yet. So that is the authorization code grant. That's what's going to, that's going to enable. Now, uh, if, as you saw in Postman, what I had to do in the environment is I had to fill out the client ID, client secret for both of the applications that we're using. And once I have these created, I can simply ask for the ID and secret for both of these um, and then just fill it out in Postman to be able to then go and make those requests. So this is where those are coming from. And of course, in the event that you're not sure uh, where your actual uh, token and uh, authorized endpoints are, uh, you can simply ask for them in this way. Uh, I've also provided a quick cleanup here. But so um, this allows you, if you run this on your own website, uh, after having run um, the generate data uh, IPython notebook, you'll be in a position where you can then turn around and use the Postman uh, collection also provided in the repository uh, with your new environment that you will have um, set up using uh, these values and run through uh, the first sub-lesson exactly as, as you saw it earlier.